Subscribe now for a chance to win a $20 Amazon gift card at the end of the month. Just stay subscribed and leave a comment on the video in the card above. A lot of things can be possessed by demons. You, me, that doll in the corner. This world is a strange one. I welcome back an old friend, Shivers, as the two of us share with you some allegedly true stories and real cases of demon possession. And this isn't just a bunch of people getting filled with some demon juice. No, there will also be a possessed object or two. So hop in the tub with the Bible and take a holy bath. You'll want a layer of protection before some demon possesses you or something you hold dear. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Shivers if you like his narrations. But first, if you've got a creepy story from Tumblr, I would love to read it and maybe even narrate it in a future video. Just send it over at darknessprevails.org. Now, let's see what demons answer this call. Number one, a paramedic's tale of demonic possession. Submitted by Josh H. Let me begin by giving you a little backstory to this particular situation. It was a humid summer night in June of 2008 or 2009, around 2 a.m. I'm a paramedic in a very, very rural area. We have a population of about 22,000 that covers about 500 square miles. The service I work for covered all 911 calls during this time. I'd been a paramedic for about two years. Prior to that, I had been an EMT for three. The majority of the calls we received were either shortness of breath due to 50% of the community being retired coal mine workers with some form of COPD or emphysema, and the rest being drug-seeking individuals with the occasional shooting, stabbing, or a car accident. That particular night, I was dispatched to a call of a female patient who was hearing voices and seeing things, things that weren't there, according to her spouse. Around this time is when bath salts and all that synthetic medication stuff exploded and people were overdosing quite frequently. In my mind, I knew this was what was going on before I even left my station. Looking back now though, I honestly wish it was just that. When I was given the address, I was kinda shocked. It wasn't in the usual slums that we pick up overdoses. It was in a part of the county that was known to have very nice homes, homes of the working class people. Upon arriving to this person's home, it reassured my thought. The place was a well-kept two-story brick house. When I knocked on the door and announced my usual greeting, EMS, did someone call for an ambulance? I was met by a 40-ish year old man. I did not need to ask where the patient was. Across from the room sat a female around the same age, just staring at us with an empty glare. It sent chills down my spine and the look on my partner's face it told me he must have felt the same. The type of stare I've never witnessed again, just empty. I introduced myself and my partner and asked her name. Her eyes moved from my partner and looked me dead in the face. And with the voice that should not have come from a 130 pound female, she said, You are too late, Joshua. They are already here. The voice gave me goosebumps. I shook it off and I asked her who was here. She was still staring me directly in the eyes and had not blinked once, and she said, Don't you feel us around you? At that time, I had already decided I wanted to get the heck out of this house. All I felt was heaviness in that house. It filled me with unease. She had no medical history or took any medications according to her husband, and she was a very healthy looking individual. Things just didn't add up. I refrained from asking any questions and just walked her outside as quickly as possible towards my ambulance. During this time, she's muttering to herself and whipping her head from side to side as if someone were speaking into her ears. I'm not a religious person at all, but this made me wonder if I was the right person to be taking care of this patient and not a priest. I loaded her into the ambulance and began my normal assessment she hadn't looked at me, but she was just shifting her eyes left and right, never looking at anything for more than two seconds. I took her vital signs. I applied a cardiac monitor, and I told her I intended on starting an IV on her. She suddenly stared at me once again and smiled with a malicious grin. Then she said, Do what you please, boy. 
I've never felt in my life so weirded out by such a small woman. It was like looking into the eyes of evil itself. After starting the IV, I sat behind her and I began the 10 minute transport to the hospital. All the while, I couldn't wait to get this thing out of my ambulance. All of a sudden, five minutes into the transport, she began chuckling in a low, deep voice that turned my blood cold. <laughs> I moved back over in front of her and asked if everything was okay. I was met with that same malicious grin and silence. She wouldn't speak and didn't for the remainder of the trip. About two minutes out, I called the local ER and informed them I was coming with a very unique patient. I personally knew all the nurses and physicians from working years alongside them. They laughed me off until they saw her with their own two eyes. She wouldn't speak, just grin and stare. They placed her on the same equipment I had put her on and returned to the nurse's station. I began to explain what had happened. They all got a good laugh at my expense as they could tell I was visually shaken. So I just told them, if you don't believe in evil, she will change your mind. At that time, the monitor they placed on her that can be seen at the nursing station, alarmed. Her respirations were 40 times a minute. Her nurse, who was a very good friend of mine, walked into the doorway of her room and just gasped and placed her hand over her mouth. She was petrified. Of course, curiosity got the best of me and I went over to examine her myself. How I wish I would have just stopped there, just dropped her off then and ran back to the station. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. She was only touching the bed with the tips of her toes and the back of her head. The entire body was in an arch, arms laid flat beside her and her eyes locked on the two of us. She was panting in a way that sounded like a growl. We called the doctor into the room and we just said, oh my God. He ordered her a very powerful sedative called Verst, which is what they give you right before you have a surgery. Two milligrams is plenty enough to put a decent sized man to sleep for a while. She remained in this position for at least five minutes, but it seemed a lot longer. Her eyes were dark and empty. Her voice was otherworldly. My blood again turned to ice. She didn't fight at all when they administered the medication. 20 seconds later, she was asleep, or so we thought. The doctor ordered a full head CT and blood work. I was pulled into her room by the nurses just in case she became violent or worse. I reached out for her arm to place a tourniquet to help draw lab work. As soon as I touched her skin though, her eyes peeled back open. She stared at me with that same empty look as the nurse went to get another dose of Verst. Two more milligrams and she was still staring into my soul. I broke eye contact and hoped she would just go to sleep, but it never happened. The amount of medication could tranquilize anyone. We drew labs without an incident, all while hoping she would test positive for something. Her lab work came back as well as her CT. Everything was negative. Nothing was out of the ordinary in the slightest way. She hadn't even taken a Tylenol. While we were discussing with the doctor what they would do next, the silence of this small town ER was broken by a blood curdling scream followed by words in a deep raspy voice that I will never forget. I am Legion. Then silence. By then I had had enough. I returned to the station. I called the ER back about an hour later to see if anything else had happened. She was transferred to a psychiatric unit about two hours away. I never cared to check up on her and have no desire to to this day. I passed that same home from time to time and it sends shivers down my spine. This has become somewhat of a legend around the hospital. No one truly believes everything that happened. For the seven people who did witness what happened, there is no doubt something otherworldly was there. Just writing and recalling that night filled me with chills. It is one night I will never forget. That was the only time I looked at pure evil, and I hope it is the last. I'm 29 years old now and still work as a paramedic, and every time I get a call of someone hearing voices, I can't help but think about her. Number two, the girl in the corner, submitted by Lynn, 
and read by Shivers. I made a stupid mistake when I was 16, and now, at 21, I have a five-year-old daughter who we will call Sophia. I don't regret it though, she is the light of my life. I also didn't end up like most other teen moms. I finished high school, and now I have a stable job and a wonderful boyfriend that treats my daughter like she's his own. About a year ago, I was sitting in bed surfing the internet on my laptop, and it was close to midnight. Also, my boyfriend worked night shifts, so Sophia, who was four at the time, and I were alone in the apartment. I was just about to go to bed, when I heard loud crying from my daughter's room. I jumped up from my bed and rushed to her. But when I opened the door, Sophia was sound asleep in her bed. I decided to ask her about it the next morning. Her response was, Maybe it was the girl in the corner. She gets a little upset sometimes. As if that alone wasn't creepy enough, after this conversation, Sophia became obsessed with the girl in the corner. She would scream if you even looked at the corner across from her bed. She had trouble sleeping, nightmares and night terrors, and sometimes she would sit in her room facing the corner, just staring. It got so bad we took her to see a psychiatrist, thinking she had early onset schizophrenia. Then, about three months ago, I got a job offer that was better than my previous job, but it was on the other side of the city, so we decided to move. And as soon as we stepped inside the new apartment, Sophia's issues vanished. No more nightmares. No more girl in the corner. I even asked her about it, but she just gave me the most confused look. As if she had no idea what I was talking about. I don't know what it was, but I'm glad it's over. Number 3. Probation. Submitted by Scarolina. I'm a male and I used to work as a juvenile probation officer for a southern state in the United States. As you can imagine, working in juvenile justice can be very unsettling. Some of these kids needed some help and some needed intensive help. Then there were those that were monsters in the making. One kid I met in that category was a kid I'll call Tony. Tony was put on probation for a year on a drug charge for simple possession and fighting in school. He seemed like a nice kid though, quiet, very polite, always kept curfew and did great in school. He kept all of his probation appointments and most of his teachers really liked him. Other than the drug charge and the fighting incident, he had no record. He was pretty much a model probationee. About three months prior to him finishing probation, he came in for a drug test and unfortunately he failed the drug test even though I liked Tony and told him that the drug test meant I had to file a violation of probation or VOP charge against him. He begged me not to file the charge, but I told him he failed the test, so I had to file the charge. And that's when things hit the fan, so to speak. He began mumbling something under his breath. I said, Tony, if you have something to say, speak up or something to that effect. So he says to me, ABC 987. And I said, what? ABC 987 was his reply. I said, I don't know what that means. What are you talking about? ABC 987, now in a lower, more menacing tone with a very creepy grin coming across his face. Then it hit me. Tony was repeating my license plate number. Every time I'd gone to Tony's house or to his school, I was always in a state vehicle, and to my knowledge, he'd never seen me getting in or out of my car, and there were several cars parked in the parking area, all belonging to the building I worked in, because it shared a parking area with about three other medium-sized office buildings. The look on my face must have told him that I knew what ABC 987 meant, because his eyes lit up, and his smile became even more sinister. As an aside, I've had to deal with some insane kids Kids that made plans to kill other people. A kid that liked to drink animal blood. Kids that raped people. I even performed an initial assessment on a kid that was planning on doing a school massacre and filming it for the internet. 
but nothing has creeped me out as much as that smile did at that moment. I will be the first to admit that all professionalism went out the door at that moment, and I began to yell obscenities at him. My boss came into the scene, and he had Tony escorted out. Then he talked to me. After I told him about telling me my license plate number, she decided to file an additional charge of making threats to a public official against Tony because it was clear to her what he was doing. I testified at the hearing about a month later, and yes, he was not locked up during that time, so I was fearful that something might happen. The judge sentenced him to an inpatient psychiatric hospital for an evaluation. That would be followed by another hearing and further recommendations based on the evaluation. Right before he got out of the psychiatric hospital, I transferred to another department with the state. However, I heard that right before he left the hospital, they found a list in his room with the judge's name, my name, and his public defender's name, the prosecutor's name, and some teacher's and student's name, all with the words, altar sacrifice, written on the page. Needless to say, at the hearing, which I was permitted to attend, normally juvenile hearings are closed to the public. The psychiatrist that prepared Tony's evaluation recommended that he be sentenced to the state hospital for an extended period of time, which the judge agreed with. I hope Tony was able to get the help that he needed, and I hope that he turned out all right. But one thing it taught me is that sometimes, even a monster can hide in plain sight and under the guise of innocence, and that the most horrible and creepiest monsters out there are human beings. Though I'm not sure if Tony was a human, a demon, or something of a host for a spirit far more sinister than I bargained for. Who knows if that was really him or something that has attached itself to him. Number four, My Beloved Doll, submitted by Clara, read by Shivers. So, it's been a long time since this happened, so please excuse me if I forget to mention something that did happen. I've dealt with multiple paranormal things in my life, from a ghost of a little girl to some sort of hate-feeding demon, but this story I'm about to tell you was sort of close to me. I used to have a haunted crusty doll. A little backstory. Since I was little, I have always loved watching The Simpsons. My favorite character being Bart for his antics and twisted sense of humor when it comes to watching cartoons. So when I had found a Bart doll, along with Krusty the Clown and Marge inside an antique mall that was just outside my town, my mom said I could pick out two knowing that I loved the show so much. I had picked Bart and Krusty. Because, for whatever reason, Marge was missing her dress. I've had these dolls for years, and never noticed anything strange about them, until I was 14 or 15 years old, when my life started getting really hard. Having to move a lot, my parents fought, and my mom and sister treated me like shit, and I developed a really bad problem. I was so incredibly lonely and hurt, I would go to my plushies for comfort. Snuggling them, or just having them near me while I played video games, would make me feel better. So as my 15th or 16th birthday started getting closer, my mom asked me what I wanted. So, I told her I wanted a plushie of Dr. Eggman from the Sonic the Hedgehog series, cause he was my favorite. After a month or so, I had got him in the mail. Then, of course, I had added him to the collection on my bed. But things started getting weird after this. I would find my new plush in other places like on the floor, or under my bed, or even sometimes across the room. One night, I just held on to my new plush, cause I was tired of having to find it every morning. But when I woke up, I was holding on to my crusty, and my new plush was at the closet door on the other side of the room. At this point, I was a lot more aware of the paranormal activity with this doll. I started leaving the doll on the other bed that was in my room, but when I'd come back, it would either be fallen over, or on the floor in between the beds, or back on the bed I slept on, where it used to sit. Currently, I don't have it in my possession. Due to moving so much, I had left it in storage. The storage place sucks, so I won't be surprised if it's eaten by rats now. Number five, Tormented by an Evil Spirit, submitted by Anonymous. 
A little background is necessary so you can understand how it relates to what has happened. I am a Wiccan and I'm no stranger to the occult or spirits. Strange things that scare most people happen around me all the time, so most weird things don't really frighten me. I don't like to tell too many people that I'm Wiccan. I would rather do what I do and be left alone. That being said, I do help people when they have problems of the spiritual kind. In October of 2016, I was on Facebook and I saw some sort of advertisement for a movie about children and Ouija boards. It was getting to be Halloween time. I did a post about it and tagged one of my friends who was also a practitioner. I was being facetious when I did it because movies like this annoy me and my friend both. There's always some skeptic out there that thinks it's a child's toy. They end up getting one just to prove that it's only a game. Then they come to find out the hard way that it can be something much darker. And then in the end, they end up no longer being skeptics. Ouija boards easily open doorways that at times are harder to close. They open gateways on the other side and anything can come through. If you don't know how to safeguard yourself, if you don't know how to close these doors, you can find yourself in serious trouble. Susie, a woman whom I am friends with and used to work with, made a comment on my post saying that I shouldn't post things I don't understand. She didn't know I was Wiccan and she did not know I was actually criticizing the Ouija board post. I private messaged her and told her I actually knew a great deal. She then went on to mention that she used one when she was a teenager and stated that because of that, she's had experiences that have affected her to this very day. I asked what she meant by that. She was extremely reluctant to tell me because she was scared that I would think her crazy. She even told me that she told a priest of her faith about her experiences and he said that her troubles were that of the mind and not the spirit. Basically, the arrogant guy was politely telling her she was insane. After some reassurance with me, she went on to tell me about her living hell. She told me that she used to have friends when she was younger that meddled with the Ouija board all the time. But what she did not realize at the time was that they were purposely summoning dark spirits. Susie's mom never let her leave the house after a certain time, but one night she let her go out and she went to her friend's house to hang out because her friends were having a party. They pulled out the board and started doing and saying some very strange things. The moment she saw that board, she was filled with dread and felt a chill in the air. One of her friends came in holding a coffer, which she assumed to be red wine, and he offered it to the group. She saw everyone drinking from it, and since she was a huge germaphobe, she refused. What happened next felt like a huge nightmare. It has severely impacted her to this day. She found out later that the coffer was filled with the sacrificial blood of a cat. She later discovered this because she found the body of a gutted cat outside. She was horrified. Later on, she confronted her friends about the cat and the drinking of its blood. She wanted to understand what they were trying to do and why they didn't tell her what was going on. They probably didn't tell her because knowing Susie, she would have noped out of there really fast. When she demanded to know what they were doing, she didn't really get a straight answer. Her relationship with her best friend that hung around with this group of people became strained from this experience and soon got toxic. She stopped talking to her shortly after. She would see the members of this group in the hallways at school, but Susie never talked to them again. The backlash from that incident didn't end there. She told me nothing was ever the same after that night. Soon after, strange things began to happen to her and around her. Something stuck with her, something attached itself to her that night, and it has stayed with her ever since. She told me it didn't matter where she was or where she went, whatever it was followed her. She told me that she has learned to live with it and ignored it, but others around her were starting to have experiences and it was scaring them. She told me of an instance where she fell asleep with the webcam on. She was talking to her cousin late at night one evening. She suddenly woke up because her bed was shaking she sat up and her cousin told her she heard a man's voice coming from the laptop and the picture on her end went out. She told me that that wasn't possible. She was the only one in the house at the time. There would be nights where she would open her eyes from sleeping and see something watching her. When she did this, she couldn't move. It was a scary looking man who would soon disappear before her eyes. She told me that one of her friends absolutely refused to come over anymore because weird things always happened when she did. Susie told me of another night where she went to her mom's house. Susie, her mom, and her nephew were all heading out when suddenly they heard a man with a very deep voice call her name. 
Susie. She looked around to see who it was. She looked at the window and there it was standing. It was there only a moment and then it disappeared. Her mother didn't see it, but she definitely heard it. Her mother knew something strange was in that house and it terrified everyone. Susie said other than her, only her nephew has ever seen it. Everyone else has only heard of it and felt its presence. Now, these kinds of experiences have been going on since she was in her mid-teens. At the time of her telling me the story, she is now in her late 20s. I decided that I was going to help her rid herself of this spirit. I told her that I was Wiccan, that I have experience with these kinds of matters. I was going to help her get rid of this possession or attached entity. I had this conversation with her the evening of October 30th of 2016. After I said goodnight to Susie, I tucked in my daughter and got ready for bed. My husband at the moment was already sleeping. I was in bed by 8.30. At exactly midnight, now officially Halloween, I heard the radio clock go off in the second bedroom on the other side of my house. It was loud and I was surprised that it didn't wake my husband or my daughter. That bedroom is a guest room and no one sleeps there on a regular basis. So I had no idea what that sound was. I didn't have any guests that night, so there was no reason why it should have been going off. I got up quickly and went to the other bedroom and turned on the light. There was the alarm clock blaring loud music at exactly 12 a.m. I turned it off and right at that moment, the hairs in the back of my neck stood up and I was covered in goosebumps. I felt a dark presence in my house. I knew exactly what it was. It must have been Susie's friend trying to scare me. Well, I wasn't scared. I was angry and I told whatever it was to get out. Soon after, my goosebumps went away and the tingling on the back of my neck subsided. I'm surprised I didn't wake my husband or my daughter with my outburst. I went back to bed angry and irritated. The next day I heard from Susie again. She was telling me that the spirit had been tormenting her and that it was worse than it has ever been. She told me that it was shaking her bed, clawing at her, and at one point had thrown her up against the wall and knocked her to the floor. I told her that I knew it would get angry with her because she is talking to me and we are trying to get rid of it. And I told her about it visiting me the previous night. She apologized, but I told her not to worry. It did not scare me. I immediately went out and got her a kit to do a smudging of her home and herself. I also made some anointing oil. I explained to Susie that she needed to do the cleansing to empower herself. Susie later came over to my house to obtain the things needed to do the cleansing that I had acquired for her. When I saw her, she told me that the entity was trying to keep her from visiting me at all. Apparently, her car wouldn't start that day. She also had problems with her computer and she hasn't been receiving messages on her phone. I asked if she wanted me to come over to her house to help her with the cleansing. Susie is a very determined woman and despite her haunting, she's a very strong one too. She assured me that I had given her enough detailed instruction and that she did not need me there. So Susie went home and I didn't hear from her. I texted her the next day to see how things were and she informed me that she didn't sleep that night. When she attempted to smudge her home, the feather burst into flames and she was unable to do the cleansing. If the evil entity burned her smudging feather, then that was my fault. I didn't even think to bless the smudging kit itself the spirit tormented Susie all night. She told me she was at work at the moment and was too scared to go home. She was now going on 48 hours without sleeping. I told her to come to my house, that she would be safe in my home and that she could sleep here. She declined, but wanted to know what to do. I told her to get another feather and to get holy water and sprinkle that on her kit and ask God to bless it. She did that, but she knew she would be too tired to perform the cleansing that night and she was still scared to go home. She asked again what she should do. I instructed her to command the spirit in the name of God to leave her alone and give her peace. So the next day I text her and asked if she was okay. She replied back that she was at work and she did exactly what I told her to do. She slept peacefully the night before for the first time in a while. I was relieved. A few days later, Susie called me telling me that she got a call from her mother her mother told her that she heard loud noises and banging coming from Susie's old room. When her mom went to investigate, Susie's old stuff was all over the place. It looked like a tornado had ripped through the room. 
Apparently, the spirit had taken refuge at her mother's house after the cleansing, and it made sure to make its presence known. Luckily, though, it did not bother her mother. It simply attacked that room. Susie was upset, and again, she asked me what to do. So I walked her through how to cleanse that part of the house. After that, weeks went by without incident. Then Susie and I met up for some Thai for an early dinner a couple of weeks later. When she came to pick me up, we began to talk, and she told me that there was another incident with the entity. But it wasn't at her mom's house or her home. She was visiting a friend's house when her friend's brother came running out of his room, screaming. He was yelling, it's moving, it's moving by itself. Susie and her friend ran into her friend's brother's room, and lo and behold, and of course, he had been using a Ouija board. Susie and her friend watched in horror and disbelief as it spelled out, I will never leave you alone, over and over again. Susie ran over to the board and said, leave me alone and go away. She flipped the board over, and when the activity stopped, she threw it away in the garbage. Even though her friend's brother was angry at her for doing that, she yelled at him to never use a Ouija board again. She didn't have any problems after that. And after hearing that story, I couldn't help but think, oh, for God's sake. Now, I know there are those out there listening to this story, not believing a word of it, or thinking me and my friend are crazy, and that's okay. I hope those of you listening that think that never have an incident to change your perception. Ouija boards are never to be used by children or most adults for that matter. They're not toys, and serious harm can come to those who simply play with them. Demon possession does not happen often, and it might even be a sort of disorder in some cases, but anything, living or not, is susceptible. But would you even know when something else is living in your skin? Would you know when it happens until it's too late? Maybe, maybe not. Just ask a friend if you've been spider crawling down the steps lately, and you might have an answer. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And subscribe to Shivers if you like what he's got. Don't forget to send us your Tumblr story soon at darknessprevails.org. Thanks.